Hello everyone, and welcome to the 43rd episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Frank Booth from Blue Velvet. As with any David Lynch film, this film is, well, a bit strange. We're taken for a ride, a ride that takes us on a journey to discover the seedy underbelly that haunts the sleepy American town of Lumberton, an underbelly that's run by perhaps the most unhinged and psychologically disturbed gangster to ever appear in a film. This character is so far removed from being even remotely normal that I think it's fair to say that there are very few moments in this film that leave us with a character who's anywhere near sympathetic. And he's a character who, from his very first scene of the film, shows himself to be a strange and deranged man, one that only shows more and more of his insanity as the film progresses. This video, as with all these videos, will be an analysis of Frank the character and not what he's intended to represent. If you're looking to find the deeper meaning behind this film as a whole, I encourage you to read articles or watch videos here on YouTube pertaining to the themes of this film. There are a number of different theories out there regarding this film and the inner workings of Frank, but there has never been any confirmation from David Lynch about what exactly is going on with Frank or whether or not the theories about this film are true. David Lynch stated in an interview once that there is a correct interpretation of his films, and you can find it if you sift through the clues he gives you. But again, he's never outright said what exactly is going on in this film, or how precisely Frank came to be Frank. In this video, you'll find what I managed to piece together from what we're given in this film. And if you found something entirely different upon your own viewing of this film, which is more than possible, I encourage you to provide your observations below, as Frank definitely deserves a healthy discussion about who exactly he is, and why he does what he does. Now without further ado, let's explore the hyper-deranged mind of one of cinema's most depraved and enchanting characters. To begin with Frank, let's first take a brief look at who he is and what he does in his day-to-day -day life. Frank is abusive and volatile with everyone around him. He's snide, condescending, and vicious when he's speaking to people, layering his words with curses as he flies off on one of his many psychotic tirades. However, it's not just Frank's personality but his actions that contribute to his villainy. Frank is a gangster, the boss of a group of psychotic thugs who are almost as unhinged as he is. In his endeavors as not only a gang leader, but linchpin of the Lumberton underworld, Frank deals in both drugs and prostitution, rigging the game in Lumberton with the help of Tom Gordon, the crooked detective on his payroll who helps Frank in murdering other drug dealers, enabling Gordon to take the drugs the police seize out of evidence and hand it over to Frank boosting his own supply whilst eliminating any competition in town. A brilliant component of this operation is Frank's use of an alter ego, the so-called well-dressed man, a persona he utilizes to interact with people in a more legitimate way. As if Frank Booth, the derelict gangster, is seen conversing with a detective, that would be more than suspicious. As a brutal and remorseless crime boss, we know that Frank is responsible for at least one murder of a rival drug dealer during this film. But who knows how many other countless individuals have fallen prey to the monster that is Frank Booth. This is who Frank Booth is outside of the focal point of the film, and his actions in regard to his criminal lifestyle are terrible. But who he is is best divined from that focal point, and that's three things. What he does to Dorothy, why he does these things to her, and how he conducts himself throughout his relationship with her. This is where the real meat of who Frank is can be found. And if we piece together the many components of his obsession with her, I believe we have a pretty clear explanation of how this relationship evolved into what it is, and who Frank is at his core. To start, I think it's best we establish exactly why Frank is holding Dorothy hostage before we move on to explore his psyche and its impact on this relationship. In a making of featurette, David Lynch explains that Frank is a person who is desperately in love, but is a man who doesn't know how to show it in a normal way. I'm sure Frank saw Dorothy performing at the Slow Club one night and fell in love with her for two reasons. One, because she's beautiful. And two, because her profession involves something that is incredibly dear to Frank's heart, music. We'll be talking about this component of Frank later on in this video, but I think it's safe to say that Frank fell hopelessly in love with Dorothy the night he saw her sing Blue Velvet for the first time. It could be that she never sang this song before meeting Frank, and he fell in love with her regardless of what she sang. But I believe him hearing this song sung by his love is what caused him to become obsessed with the song along with her. But more on that later. 
Upon learning that Dorothy was married, I'm sure this spurred Frank into a mad frenzy, as he realized that the object of his obsession was further out of his reach than she already was due to his inability to properly express his feelings. Thus, Frank decides to kidnap both her husband and her son, keeping them hostage in a safe house operated by one of his equally deranged associates to in turn hold her hostage as his veritable sex slave. Though I'm sure Frank, in his own twisted way, believes her to be his lover and not his hostage. This is heinous enough already, but to make it even more deplorable, we have on display for us the way that Frank goes about engaging in this terrible bondage. Actions that are best explained while examining his psyche, which we'll move on to now. Frank has clearly suffered some sort of trauma in his life, and what exactly that trauma was is something we'll never truly know. But I think it's safe to say that he grew up abused physically, verbally, and sexually. His establishment of a twisted parental dynamic with Dorothy indicates that perhaps he grew up attracted to his mother in some way and abused by his father, whom he resented for both the abuse and as an obstacle between himself and his mother, much in the same way that Dorothy's husband, her child, and Jeffrey were obstacles between himself and Dorothy. I'm sure Frank's father abused his wife as well, and the way Frank behaves towards Dorothy when he's sober indicates to me that he's become the same man his father was, and he's imitating the behavior that his father displayed towards Frank and his mother when he was a child. He demands that Dorothy call him daddy, and he's extremely violent and rude when he's speaking with her, with an overbearing posture and dominant mannerisms that I imagine closely mimic how his father acted towards his own mother when he was younger. I think something that Frank says when he's intimidating Jeffrey reveals something very important to us. He calls a love letter from himself a bullet from a gun, and if you receive a love letter from him, you're screwed forever. While in the moment, this is seen as an incredibly odd thing to say, but if you take into account the likely violent behavior he experienced from his father, you can see how Frank eventually began to equate violence with love, and Frank saying this line shows us that Frank expresses his love with violence. Now in contrast to this sober father persona, is Frank's transformation into a man-child once he's inhaled his amyl nitrate, a drug that is supposed to enhance one's sexual arousal. This drug-induced personality seems to bring out Frank's insecurities and vulnerabilities, reverting him to his younger self, a child who was obsessed with his own mother as his first object of sexual attraction. Something that is a constant between these two personalities is Frank's demand that nobody looks directly at him when he's engaged in these depraved acts. I'm not entirely sure if this is something that his father may have done when he was younger for the following reason, or if this is Frank's own way of showing either guilt or embarrassment for his actions, but I believe that's essentially what's going on here. Frank, whether he knows it or not, is pathologically embarrassed of the behavior he's engaged in, and though he enjoys it, he's also ashamed of what he's doing. This embarrassment ties into another crucial component to everything Frank does in this film, and that's his appreciation and love for music, and not just any music, but two songs in particular, Blue Velvet and In Dreams by Roy Orbison. Let's take a look at each to determine why Frank is obsessed with these songs. During the performance or playing of either, Frank has an emotional reaction, but which lines he reacts to are key here. Like a flame burning brightly, but when she left, gone was the glow of blue velvet. But in my heart, there'll always be precious and warm a memory, through the years, and I still can see blue velvet through my tears. These are the lines that are sung by Dorothy during the scene where we see Frank crying during one of her performances. There could be a few ways to interpret this moment, and if you have alternate ones from the one I'm going to lay out for you now, let me know down in the comments. But I think this is Frank choking up over the fact that Dorothy is a light in his life, and the image of her singing and the feeling it gives him is a memory he holds dear to him one that brings out his tender feelings for her. His lucky piece of blue velvet and the robe he took it from is a source of comfort for him, one that reminds him of one of the only good and pure things he has in his life, Dorothy, and his love for her. I still can see blue velvet through my tears. That's a line that hits Frank in his emotional core, as through all his sorrow, his pain, and his madness, he still has the image of blue velvet, Dorothy Valens, to comfort him, like a flame burning brightly. This line is important as well, as light is very specific to his obsession with Dorothy, 
as though Frank isn't exactly a great guy normally. When he says the words, and now it's dark, his mood changes dramatically. I believe this indicates that Frank views himself as the dark, and when he's regressing to his abusive and primal state, his uttering of these words is meant to signify this change. Where the light in Frank is his love for Dorothy and the image of Dorothy herself, the dark is Frank and the terrible way in which he expresses his feelings. I mentioned earlier that Frank may have fallen in love with Dorothy when he saw her sing this song for the first time, and I think if that's true, it fits with this theory. Perhaps Frank has been obsessed with Blue Velvet for a long time, but it would make sense that his obsession with it comes from his obsession with Dorothy. Now the second song, In Dreams, has a lot to do with his relationship with Dorothy as well. Frank is obviously moved by this entire song, just like with Blue Velvet, as we can see during Ben's lip-syncing performance. But just like with Blue Velvet, there's a line in particular where Frank begins to show his emotion. I softly say a silent prayer like dreamers do. Then I fall asleep to dream my dreams of you. In dreams, I walk with you. In dreams, I talk to you. In dreams, you're mine all the time. At the start of this verse, Frank looks as if he's about to cry once again. And by the time it finishes, his emotions have built up into a rage. And after a moment, he once again utters the words, and now it's dark. For Frank, these lines are all in reference to how he views Dorothy and his inability to have a proper relationship with her. When Frank is asleep and dreaming, perhaps he lives a life of normality where he lives a happy life with his true love. During the playing of this song, he's initially warmed by this fantasy, but as he comes back down to reality, he becomes enraged as he knows it's just a dream that will never become a reality. The way he repeats these lines when he's threatening Jeffrey have the same undertone. As though he's speaking to Jeffrey here, he again becomes emotional as the beginning of this verse hits his ears, and in his own twisted way, he's explaining to Jeffrey that she's his forever, and there's nothing that he can do about it. However, there is something Jeffrey can do about it, and he does. Upon revealing Frank's true nature to the police, Frank is warned by Tom Gordon of the impending doom that is closing in upon him, and Frank in turn reacts by brutalizing Dorothy as revenge for letting Jeffrey worm his way into his operation and for breaking his heart. Frank also murders her husband to cause further misery for her, and afterwards, he mutilates and then murders Tom Gordon, likely to cover his bases as the detective knows too much. This spells the end for Frank's time as criminal lord of Lumberton, but it seems that Frank almost gets away. However, he returns to Dorothy's apartment, an act which doesn't make sense, except when you consider the fact that Frank left behind his piece of blue velvet, the only thing he has left to remind him of the only good thing he ever had in his life. So Frank returns for the object of his obsession and fittingly meets his end at the hands of Jeffrey. And at this end, who was Frank Booth? He's a man whose mind was warped by untold trauma, one who became involved in a criminal lifestyle, a lifestyle that led him to projecting his own abuse on others, which ultimately led to murder and to a path that took him further down the rabbit hole of mental instability and depravity. Eventually, this damaged man discovered someone who broke through the darkness that was the never-ending storm in his mind, a shining ray of sunlight Dorothy Valens, incapable of handling his overwhelming feelings for her and distraught over his prospects of being with her due to her marriage. He kidnapped her husband and her child, mutilating her husband as he held him and her child as a bargaining chip for Dorothy to be his lover. During his time as Dorothy's quote-unquote lover, he verbally, physically, and sexually abused her, putting this woman through the hell he himself once lived through. I believe Frank Booth is a brilliant example of the ramifications of child abuse. This abuse stays with a person for the rest of their life, and many are able to overcome the disadvantages that this unfortunate upbringing gives them. But some, like Frank Booth, never truly recover from their traumas, and instead, they adapt their own personalities to the most brutal constant present in their lives, abuse. Frank Booth was a sadistic and brutal lunatic who destroyed the lives of an untold amount of people with his utterly insane behavior. A man who, without a doubt, 
is thoroughly repugnant, and though he's had many disadvantages when it comes to living a normal life, he's a man who made conscious and malicious decisions to harm people in incredibly sickening ways. Even though all of these things are certainly true, I believe there's something else we always need to consider when examining these characters, something that we should never forget. And that's the fact that evil isn't inherent. It's developed over time, grown from negative experiences, hardship, or trauma. And though people like Frank may have traits and attributes from birth that could be harmful, they are nurtured into becoming problematic, as people like Frank are ultimately shaped into who they are by outside influences that sometimes irrevocably damage the way a person thinks and feels, pushing people over the edge of sanity and morality into a bottomless pit of evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Frank? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you liked this video and want to see more like it appearing in your feed, Click the subscribe button to keep up on the latest episodes, and feel free to leave a like while you're at it. Thank you once again to all of my existing subscribers for your continued and incredible support. If you'd like to support the channel even further, consider signing up as a patron over on Patreon. You can find a link to Patreon down in the description. Thank you to everyone who signed up so far, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed in the description for occasional updates on the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.